Hi, listeners. Welcome to the Grief Out Loud podcast produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Jana DeCristofaro and wanted to give you just a little heads up as you listen to this episode, you'll be hearing references to our old name, which was Dear Ducky. So just so you don't get too confused, you're listening to the right podcast and we look forward to bringing you even more great content under the Grief Out Loud name. Thanks for joining us. Hey listeners, thanks for tuning in today. Just a quick heads up that we are experimenting with some new technology here at Dear Dougie, which will make it easier to connect with people who are calling in from all around the country and maybe even the world one day. So just be prepared. Things might sound a little different. We might hop from one sound to another, um, but we just ask for your patience as we try out new ways of recording people and their really important stories. Hello, and welcome to the Dear Dougie podcast, produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Jana DeCristofaro, and thank you for tuning in today. This podcast is meant to open up the often avoided conversation about grief. While we will all experience loss during our lives, when it occurs, most of us are left not knowing what to do, how to feel, or how to talk about it. So whether you're grieving a loss or wanting to support someone who is, we hope these podcast conversations will lead to a better understanding of grief, and also provide you with some ideas and inspiration for how to show up for yourself and those you care about. There are a number of great websites out there for young adults facing grief. There's What's Your Grief, Modern Loss, and Too Damn Young. One of my newest favorites, lossandfoundxo.com, is the creation of today's guest, Rachel Ricketts. Welcome, Rachel. Hi. It's so great to have you on the show today. Thanks. Glad to be here. Rachel is talking to us today from Vancouver, Canada. And she writes with blunt honesty about the grief that hit her when her mother died after an almost 20-year struggle with MS. Along with this blunt honesty, there can come some strong language. So if you're listening with kids today, or if you're not too keen on cuss words, you might want to skip this one. Rachel, when I first checked out your site, one of the first things I saw was your phrase, to be able to grieve aloud. And my reaction was, yes, exactly. This is what the world needs more of. Can you give us a little background on your story and what inspired you to start Lost and Found XO? I started this site after losing my mom last year, actually almost almost a year precisely next week. She had, as you had mentioned, struggled with multiple sclerosis most of my life since I was 13. Um, So she just kind of increasingly became more and more disabled. I increasingly became more and more parental uh, and more and more responsible, more and more of an adult. Um, so there are many, many losses that happened along the way. And of course, the epitome of that being her actual death that occurred last year, um, which she actually chose. She just felt that her quality of life was so abhorrent. And I agreed that, you know, the doctor said she could live another five to 10 years. And we kind of argued, well, what kind of life is this that she's living? She was completely bed bound, bed sores, incredible pain, pain that like is unimaginable to, to the average human being. And that was her day to day. So she actually ended up starving herself to death, voluntary cessation of eating and drinking because assisted death was not legal in Canada at the time. It is now. And it was actually quite a peaceful process, but quite a struggle to get to that point um, and to alleviate some of the concerns of people around us, uh, including the medical community in her making that choice. So that was the big loss. But as I mentioned, there were lots of losses that happened along the way, specifically with respect to my mom, but also other losses that happened outside of that entire relationship or realm including job loss. I'm what I call a recovery lawyer. Worked in private practice for four years as a corporate and entertainment lawyer and then just kind of hit a wall one day and realized this is not my life's purpose. And um, I also was in a car accident two years ago, the same week I lost my mom, actually. My mom died on the 27th of October. I got in a car accident on the 29th, but a year prior. I don't really believe in coincidence, so um, I you know, I'm not sure why that all happened in the span of a week, but I think sometimes you, you get wake-up calls and it's up to you whether you actually heed and listen to it or not. Um, so I'm doing my best to really sit in all of that and, and heed and listen to it. So dealing with chronic pain on a regular basis and the loss of, you know, life as I once knew it in a, in a different way. I'm a quite physical, active person, and a lot of my stress relief comes from physical activity and so not being able to partake in that same way or even just be able to, to partake in activities with my friends in the, in the same way. So you lost been, access uh, to a lot of the things that you would do to take care of yourself. Yeah. So all of that compounded really came to a head, I guess, when I lost my mom, because that's the biggest kind of kick in the gut in my life. But it really brings up to me, grief is kind of like a shitstorm of all sorts of losses. I think when you grieve one loss, you're actually usually grieving quite a few, whether you know it or not. You're an only grieving daughter. 
Yep. Right. Because you were an only <laughs> child and your mom was mm-hmm. your one parent or at least the parent that you yeah. grew up with and were connected yeah. to. And then you were her caregiver for almost two decades. How has her death changed your own identity? I really actually had concerns about that before she died. Anticipatory grief was really big for me because, again, one of the major losses that I, I had was realizing that our roles reversed quite early on and I became primary caretaker. And then later in life, I was kind of like, well, what is this going to mean for me when she goes? Because such a huge portion of my identity is my mom and the fact that she's sick and the fact that I take care of her. You know, like anyone who knows me knows that that's a really integral part to who I am. It was something that I always felt really important to share with people because I felt like they wouldn't really know or understand me unless they knew that part. So to have that uh, no longer be the case, to have this huge amount of time and space and energy that you know you can now refocus on xyz seems quite daunting at first for me i think another reason why i ended up starting loss and sound was i wanted to channel that time space and energy into something that was fruitful and productive not only for me but for other people and um, but i think the biggest shift really was learning to take care of myself and also that i can and should make myself a priority Actually, that has been a really big gift from grief is that I had to make myself a priority because I really wasn't going to survive it if I didn't. Yeah, you write it about that the one thing that made you feel better in all of this was you. Can you say a little bit more about that? I think coming from like the the background that I have, my, my dad's still around. He's just not someone that I want in my life. And I've tried really, really hard to include him and, and have a relationship that I thought would be you know healthy and fruitful. And I just have given up. I think that's the best and healthiest choice at, at this point in time. But it's still a huge, another loss and it's quite sad. And being an only child, I can feel quite alone in the world and especially losing my mom. You know, who are you if you aren't rooted in family. I mean, and that also calls into question the definition of family. I really consider a lot of my friends and and their parents and siblings my family, but like real blood relatives. I was kind of thinking about this last night. I feel like I'm a dandelion and someone's just like blown on me and I'm little pieces that are all over the place suspended and we're trying to waiting to land and figure out if and where we'll we'll find new roots. That's kind of been a constant struggle for me and definitely got really, really aggravated in the wake of my mom's death. Um, And what I keep coming back to is really like, well, I'm enough. I'm here. I'm a whole person. And anything that I need or want or desire, I can really make or create for myself. And that's kind of the antidote to me feeling completely overwhelmed by loss and grief, because I think a lot of the feelings of that we identify as pain or feeling overwhelmed are really a lot of the times feeling isolated, alone, and unable to really explain yourself or find people for which your story will land or resonate. I read something the other day that was like, grief is like you're out to sea drowning and everyone's just watching you. And you've had to come back to, you know, you talked about how your identity was going to shift so drastically with your mom dying. And it seems like grief has brought you to a closer, I don't know the right word for it, but a, a deeper understanding of your identity of yourself as the foundation Absolutely. I'm, I've always been keenly interested in my own self-development. And I think being told at 13, like, so your mom's just sick and she's just going to continue to get sick and then she's going to die. And you're going to have to be there to witness and really like stand in and help her through all this alone, essentially. will really kind of, <laughs> it'll fuck you up. So you kind of have to figure out how you're going to how are you going to move yourself through that? So for me, I was like self-development, self-help, self-work. You know, I ended up going to law school, but I was a psych undergrad and I knew if I didn't end up in law school, I was going to become a psychologist or psychiatrist or something of the like, like helping people and understanding people's psyches. Most importantly, my own has always been really important to me. I definitely got a huge, huge, huge crash course in that through this process of grief. Like really like, who are you? What are you about? And what do you want to be about? Like really bringing that into focus and crystallizing it for you. Yeah, I mean, because I've experienced lows like unparalleled in my life. Like I didn't even know. I I guess I just never thought I would experience the sadness that I have experienced. I just I just could never have imagined what that actually would be or feel like. Which I I'm imagining would be really shocking since you've spent so much of your life being in the midst of your mom's illness and her worsening condition and kind of going through a lot of sadness and then for her when she dies to have this whole other intensity of sadness that there's really no way to prepare for. There's really not and and I um I think sadly also people feel like it's less of a blow if it's expected. 
especially because it's been going on for decades, truly, you know, everyone's like, well, I mean, you always knew it was going to come. It really doesn't matter. I mean, there's no way yeah. to prepare yourself for the loss of someone close to you. I think in particular, a parent or a child, I had a hard time processing it for myself because I felt a lot of should. I should, you know, as they say, don't should all over yourself. I should all over myself all the time. Like, well, you knew this was coming. And so it shouldn't be as bad or you shouldn't grieve as long or all sorts of shoulds. And there's just no shoulds when it comes to grief. You write a piece that says, do yourself and your loved ones a big favor and choose to acknowledge where you're at. You may feel like your heart has shattered into a million pieces that no one in the world understands you and or be pissed at the universe. Whatever or however you feel, own it. And it seems that really speaks to that idea of, I can't predict how this is going to go, even if other people are trying to predict for me how it's going to go. And when it's actually Mm -hmm. happening, the best thing I can do is to acknowledge it. Acknowledging that it was happening was really big. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people like literally live in a a society that's so afraid of the topic that people will be morbidly sick, terminally ill, and like we still won't even acknowledge that that that's the case um, or have conversations that can be really healing and life changing to have. I love my mom, obviously, above and beyond, but she was a really challenging woman. She was a a stubborn, proud, independent lady. And when you are someone who is chronically ill and debilitated and you literally depend on other people for your day-to-day, being proud, stubborn, and independent, like, not super helpful. Um, We had a lot of challenges, but at the very end, we were able to have the most incredible conversations about her life and kind of I started to really see and understand why she was the way she was. I learned a lot more about my familial path, more about her parents, and I just got a lot of insight and I was able to really heal a lot of wounds. She didn't hug me a lot when I was a kid and I think that was always hard for me. She always expressed her love in a very specific way, but like touching, physical touching was not really a thing. And so she said, I think in her last week, of living, she said, you know, I didn't hug you very much when you were young because my mom always demanded that I like come over and kiss her and give her a hug. And I just, I didn't want to be that person to you because I hated that experience so much as a kid. So I never hugged you. Like I went the opposite direction. Protect you or provide something. Absolutely. From her experience completely. And so that's, was something that, and it's not something I sit like, sit and, you know, ruminate over, like, wow, oh, never hug me. I really didn't think about it that much, but to just have that piece of information, like, oh, wow, like, you know, I really think I needed those hugs as a, as a little girl. And to understand that she was really coming at that situation from love and, and trying to just ensure that I didn't feel, you know, dominated or pressured in a way that she felt growing up. And so actually in the last week of her life, she asked that I hug her, you know, every time I came in or left the house or left the hospice. I would give her a hug. Would you describe that as a a healing experience? Absolutely, completely. I've seen a lot of people with a lot of guilt and a lot of regret, and it literally eats them from the inside out. Uh, And I can say I don't have guilt about my mom's passing, and I don't have a lot of regrets. Definitely have some, but none that keep me up at night. And I've seen the impact of it on people. Um, When you're in the wake of something already so painful, so challenging, so life-altering, to also have on top of that feeling I should have done this. I wish I'd done this. Given given that realization that you were able to avert a lot of those regrets, how has your experience with her death changed how you are with your current relationships? Yeah, after she died, my capacity for bullshit went to zero. <laughs> and I just having meaningful, open, authentic relationships with genuine individuals is of the utmost importance to me. Um, And I definitely lost some relationships through this experience, but the relationships that to me were were ones that I don't need or or at least don't need right now and just simply aren't serving the new space I've stepped into, which is, yeah, just like really honest, truthful, integral, genuine relationships so that I feel extremely close on a whole lot of levels with the people who are in my life and they know how important they are to me. I know how important I am to them. And like, we're really there for each other through thick and thin. There's no tiptoeing around issues. My level of communication and honesty with people has skyrocketed. And it's been really hard. It's not easy and requires a lot of vulnerability, which in, in the wake of grief is extremely trying. But it's just something I've completely committed myself to because that's how I want to live my life. I know for me, it almost feels like there's not another choice, even though it's really hard yeah. work to do that and to be really transparent and bring things up with people and try to clear things up. 
I think living in, well, at least in the job that I have of being faced with so many stories of people dying day after day after day after day, there's like an urgency to me of clearing the decks, not by clearing the decks of the people, but of of the things that could be standing in the way of being able to connect. Absolutely. And I just, I think that brings so much more abundance to my life and my daily experience. So not only is it like, okay, if this person, if something happened to this person, um, would I feel confident and secure in the relationship that we have and the things that I've shared with them? But if something happened to me, like living in the wake of my mom being sick and like, you know, kind of feeling like she could die at any point for so many years was really difficult but it also really highlighted for me that that's true of all of us. I was just aware of it with my mom. But I have had friends whose parents walked down the stairs and fell. Friend's mom broke her neck and died. Just like that. Boom. And I didn't live in that space in a morbid way. It's just the truth. Like, I was kind of always like, well, I can get hit by a bus tomorrow. And I really held mm-hmm. my mom to that as well. Like, I was like, you're sick. I realized. And you could go first. But I could go first. We don't actually know. Right. What's going to happen? So it's also up to you, even though you're sick, to still like honor me. Right. We still have to show up for each other in this way. Absolutely. Rachel, in our little, the little time that we have left, I had one other question for you. What do you see as the balance or the line of looking at grief as a powerful avenue for positive transformation and the forced upon sense that we have to see tragedy as something that's good that's happened to us? How do you make that distinction in your life? It's such a good question, and that's a really hard one. I say something about this on the site. Like, I don't think that loss and tragedy in and of themselves make us stronger or better people because they don't. Those events that happen to us in and of themselves are absolutely oftentimes heinous, horrifying, painful beyond belief, and bring you to a place of, like, despair that you never knew imaginable. I think how you choose to respond to those events of loss and grief and tragedy. It's in that work that you can become a more peaceful, um, more present, more potent, more powerful human being. And that has certainly been my experience, but I guess I want to be clear in saying it's not like, oh, my mom died, so now I'm going to go through this amazing transformation and become this awesome person. Like I just really decided in those really hard moments that I, I was going to turn this tragedy into an opportunity for myself And I just thought, after all this pain, through all this grief, through all this despair, there just has to be a better way out than, like, turning to a bottle or to drugs or just becoming, like, a codependent human being or just, like, putting my hands up in the air and just not really caring or numbing out. And for me, I mean, that was really hard. I'm not trying to make it sound simple. It's absolutely not. It was a decision I had to continuously make over and over and over in my absolute darkest moments. There's a part of seeing darkness in that way that allows you to see light in a way I've never seen it before. And so even little things like the people who did show up for me and the way that they showed up for me, like really renewed my faith in humans and and love in the universe. I think it's really a choice that you make. And a lot of it comes from being able to feel supported and like you're not alone. Like people are there for you. There are people who have had experiences similar to yours. No one will ever have had an experience like yours, but similar to yours, you can kind of understand some of the feelings that you're going through and who are just there for you. And I think when you actually feel like you can share how you really feel, like authentically feel, like the fact that I could really say to my friends, like not feeling good, need some love and support so I can like really get through this and have people really show up for me is what brought me through all of it. And that's why I created Lost and Found so that people feel like they have a space that they can come to with other people who also have some understanding of what loss and grief is about. And we can all really support each other to not only see and hear from me, but see and hear from others as well. So I have a series on here called Lost Convos, which I just interview a bunch of different people with an array of different kinds of losses and just talk about what that experience was like for them and what they learned from it. Because the nugget, as I mentioned, is not the loss itself. It's like, well, what did you take away from that? I love that it's L-O-S-S parentheses T and parentheses. So lost, but not really. Rachel, thank you so much for calling us today from across country lines to be a guest on Dear Dougie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so appreciative of all the work that you guys are doing. It's such a great podcast. And really, everyone, please go check out lossandfoundxo.com. It is such an amazing website. I will link to it in our show notes. Thanks again for listening and hope you'll join us again next time. Thanks for listening.